Cheers. Um, yeah, so I, I'm Rob, and this talks about why critical thinking is not the problem. Uh, it's not the answer to tackling this misinformation. So I'm a social psychologist, so I, I care much about how the environment and people around us affect our behaviour. So I'm not the other type of psychologist, so I listen to your problems, because I'm... I'll give you rubbish advice and I don't really care, um, <laughs> is, is the truth. Um, so I'm actually part of the Centre for Doctoral Training in Trust, Identity, Privacy and Security at Scale, um, which is a collaboration between universities of Bath and Bristol. And we're very infrastructure based in our security. So my infrastructure is a little weird. So I'm trying to help secure um, information communication online and our ability to trust that information. So kind of like some of the other talks. So I'm going to present two of my first PhD um studies which are quite exploratory but they're quite fun hopefully so what i care about is why do people end up not that believing like um that covid could make you magnetic or getting this far where you become an extremism and get arrested for the rest of your life um so what the process is why do normal rational people end up thinking like this uh, so first thing to say is that we can't know everything um, so we have to rely on other people. We have to trust other people's information. And as you all know, there's a lot of information online. Some trustworthy, some not trustworthy. Uh, so what I kind of care about is if you don't know what the information, if you don't know if it's trustworthy or not, how do we evaluate it? And I say there's, or not just me, research says there's trust cues. So we take these little heuristics from the environment, the digital environment, and we calculate the trustworthiness of information through those. So, what are trust cues? Um, there's loads of different types. There's anything that we use as a shortcut to trust information. So, it's been mentioned already, social proof like rating systems and comments are quite a good one. Um, there's symbols like this, so a living wage employer, so that could show that the company is has a lot of integrity, so you might trust it because of that. Or there's ability cues, um, so doctors are often trusted. Um, and even symbols like padlocks, even if they should or shouldn't be, they're still trusted. So we take these um, cues and people who want to be trusted try and communicate these cues across uh, social media, which is a noisy, messy environment. So the theory I kind of put to it is something called signal detection theory, which is really basic, really simple. And if a trust cue is communicated properly, it hits. So is it signal? Yes. Has the response been good? Yes. So I, as someone who's reading the information and trusts it, I've gone through that process. Other things can happen when it's noisy. So there's false alarms. So Maybe you trust something you shouldn't, or because it's a noisy environment, you don't always get the messages you should. So this is the kind of basic, simple theory we were putting towards the um, review, which I'm about to talk about. So these trust cues that I get obsessed over, what are they? Um, I did a systematic review, which was taking a ton of papers. So in the end, it was two and a half, well, almost two and a half thousand papers. Um, going through a screening process and having 63 left that met all my criteria for the studies. And from those 63 papers, I looked at the evidence base for trust cues. So cues that we know will communicate um, trustworthiness. So even if it's a noisy environment, they still work. Um, so I got these studies from social technical disciplines. So psychology, um, computer science, uh, electrical engineering, a massive range um, and really tried to hit the kind of social technical um, space so we could synthesize all of the evidence we have. I also did a second question where I looked at interventions to help us evaluate these cues because as some of the other talks have said, we're not actually very good at evaluating what we should and shouldn't trust online. Uh, so it ended up looking like this. So the results, I did something called a thematic analysis, which is a very qualitative uh, method. So I took all these cues, I looked at them, I coded them for what they actually did and what they were, and then I grouped them together. So the three themes I got from those groups, uh, one was verifiability cues. So it was any information that believed people could verify who the person was and what they said. So profile pictures were a really good one, but business names, um, email addresses, However, as someone said previously, all stuff would be really easily faked online, so it's actually a bit useless. Uh, expectancy violations. So this was quite interesting. Is It's more about the digital environment and the design. So as long as websites, social media looked how people thought it should, they were quite happy. So it's only when something kind of looked out of place that they started going for a more 
uh, distrusting and critical, not critical thinking, so I'm having a go at that, but maybe a more suspicious mind. So as long as it looks right, you're good. And then the last one, quickly talked about social aspects of trust. So again, it was very social proofy, very um, comments, likes, retweets, all these kind of things, all these little heuristics that we use, but are actually, again, pretty bad. Second one, I looked at interventions that helped correctly judge digital information. So we wanted to do a meta-analysis and look at the effect size. So we look at how the interventions were scored before they took part and then how they scored after. However, because it was this big range of disciplines, reporting standards are different across disciplines. We weren't actually able to do that. So again, we had to go down the thematic route. Uh, so I'll just highlight a few. So the technical ones often try to summarize metadata and give you more information to evaluate, even though you still haven't got the skills. So good in one way if you understand what the metadata is and other things, but not so good if you don't. Social um, interventions try to teach critical thinking and these, the effect sizes and the uh, how long the interventions last or tend to drop off after a few weeks, so they're not actually that good anyway. The one that was actually a really good one was this um, social technical intervention. So what they did is put a midwife in a Facebook forum and had new mothers um, have a direct link with expertise, essentially, and trustworthy information. So it was using expertise, which is something we should trust, and using the system to distribute that knowledge properly. So these are the kind of things where we should be taken advantage of. Um, So did this big review of trust. Um, trust cues had a big database now saying right I know these things raise trust but I know it's not as simple as that um, so I started trying to think okay how are these trust cues used so we all see the world differently which is evidenced by this bit of rugby here so that is Wales should be scoring a try a few years ago and my English mate to this day still says it wasn't a try and I'm like well clearly was but it's just trying to demonstrate that your background could shape your perception of the world um, and it Definitely happens with behavior. So this model on the right is called the Brunswick Lens Model. So it's quite an old theory, but it describes um, how when we don't know what the validity of information would be, we take cues from across the environment. So if it was on Twitter, for example, you could look at shared followers, whether they have an avatar as a profile picture, um, previous posts you could look through. We take these cues, and these cues become a lens to how we uh, validate the information and how we see the information, whether it's trustworthy or not. And taking that kind of thinking, we were like, okay, well, how do we explore this? What do we do? Like, how do we know if people are actually going through these processes? So this is where study two comes in. And this was um, identifying trust cues in an open source software library. So we took the um, R, so statistical coding language for anyone who doesn't know. We looked at open source software libraries because I am technically a security researcher, even though I'm very psychological based. So we were like, okay, let's look at open source software attacks. And let's start thinking about how people trust which packages, what to download, what code to trust. So for this, we um, had 20 participants. They all had to have used R and CRAN as a library before. Um, However, 10 were really experienced, 10 were not so experienced. So the methodology we went through, we had a Microsoft Teams meeting. They shared their screen while it's interacting with CRAN. And basically, they were pointing out to me things they trust, things they didn't trust. We then transcribed those interviews and coded it line by line to say, this means this, this means this, this means this. We now have an even bigger um, database of trust queues, which we went on to, again, theme and categorize. Very similar to before, however, slightly different application. So on the top left, uh, we saw we saw some called perceived factors of trustworthiness, uh, which is classic trust theory. Um, which says ability, benevolence, and integrity will raise. If you have those things, it will raise your perception of trust. So these cues are things people were looking for without knowing they were looking for it. Um, which, for example, was research papers, anything that grant any documentation that said, actually, this isn't just code, this has been published, blah, blah, blah. They saw it as a ability or could have said integrity as well. Again, digital environment matters. So if anyone's used CRAN here, you'll know it's a horrible website that looks like it's from the 90s, which was good because it started making people question things and got them talking quite a lot. Um, But again, if you want to raise people's trust, just make it look professional, make it look good, and they just won't really question it. This one's more important, is social aspects of trust, um, which is looking at... um, 
how we get recommendations from colleagues and friends and peers. Problem is, trusting those people, they don't necessarily know what they're on about either. So we end up over-relying on trust from people who aren't validating the information. And it all goes into this theory called routine activity theory, which is a criminological theory that talks about a crime will happen when we have a motivated offender, which is pretty much any OSS attack, because the victims come to you, you have to do no work, they just download it. Um, a lack of capable guardian, so as someone else just talked about this morning, we haven't really got the police and resources online, um, and the people we are going to for help don't know what they're on about either. So it all creates this um, suitable victim as well. And it might explain why there's such a rise in, uh, rise in OSS attacks. So what's it mean for critical thinking? Um, it means we're already critically thinking. It's not that people aren't thinking about what they're interacting with online. It's that over here, the interaction of psychology, information systems, and engaging business models make it quite hard for us to properly understand what information we should be trusting. Also, in the past, we had people like teachers, librarians, um, news editors that would pick which information we saw before social media. Now, we don't have that. We've all got access to the internet. We've all got access to this raw information that we can't necessarily, or we haven't got the skills to judge yet. And then finally, like I said, the lack of guardians or gate information gatekeepers is something we, I'd say, is a big one. So can we reintroduce these? Uh, which goes on to my last slide, which is just a kind of future thoughts and what I'm trying to do in my research. So we need to understand more about trust online. We um, especially trust in information online. A lot of our theory is based on um, face-to-face trust, which does change online from my research. Um, and we need to do more quantification. So we need more, <laughs> more statistics, better measurement tools um, to do better experiments. Then in reintroducing the role of information gatekeepers in online settings. So this is more of a kind of business side, but can we use people like midwives? Can we make the case that we should have expertise at your fingertip as well as having to go into, I don't know, physical places? Um, and maybe it would save people money. So I don't know, midwives, instead of having to go to 10 different places in the town in the day, they come to you online. So there should be a case for it. And then can we design a digital environment to promote distrust? So like I said earlier, that horrible site from the 90s did set people off. It did make them think, oh, I don't trust this. So what can we do to try and promote cues like that way? And all to save grandma who thinks this is a bird dog, but it's a dog with a ham on its face. All to try and sort that out. And that's kind of my key pitch. Yeah, cheers.